for the summer. We've got our Kids You kiddos here, and so if you've got a Kids You kiddo here parent, just relax. I'm so glad they're here. They make a little noise. They wiggle around. I love it. I love having our kids in here. Amen. Uh, all ages. And so Me I never too. know. People come up and say, oh, my, I'm sorry my child is making a noise. I zone out. I have no clue. And <laughs> if anybody around you has any problem, don't worry. They'll never understand. So it's just don't worry about them. All right. So glad they're here. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the truths of these songs that we sing, these truths that come from Scripture about you. And Lord, you, you are all of those things and a thousand things more. You have no flaw. You have no weakness. Nothing surprises you. Nothing has ever occurred to you because you've <laughs> known everything forever. Oh, God, today in your word, remind us of these things. Yes. We have pain, we have questions, we have confusion, but help us today to have faith, to have patience, to be able to wait and trust. Pray that you would use your word today to defeat the lies of the enemy as he causes us to begin to wonder if you really have it all figured out. Oh, be glorified, I pray today, as we look at your word and we study it and we receive it and we act on it. We pray for sister churches today. We pray for Iglesia Bautista Emmanuel here in town, that you would just Amen. do a great work there today, that you'd help them to reach the lost in Amen. droves. As we pray for missionaries, we pray for Abraham in, and Grace serving in North Africa and the Middle East. God, use them, protect them, bless them. Encourage them, lead them to open hearts, to believe in Christ and to tell others. Mm. And, oh, Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you'd fall on this place and you'd get great glory today. Mm -hmm. In the name and the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, we ask it. Amen. 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 Take your copy of God's Word and turn to the book of Job, chapter 32, as we continue our study in the book of Job. <clears throat> and once again, as we look at these speeches... We are taking a chunk of Scripture, and then next week uh, we will hear from God. We will hear from God from His Word every, every time we open it, but we'll hear specifically the speech in Job that God gives. But today we're in chapter 32 and so forth. Now we have, um, let's try to hit the highlights here of these speeches. There was just too much to pass up, so you're going to have to listen quickly today. Uh, for me to, uh, to finish in time. Job chapter 32. I have never met the President of the United States. Maybe you have. But if you do meet the President of the United States, you will be prepped. Uh, you won't just show up, march in, throw the door open, and say, hey, Mr. President, what's happening? Uh, there'll be an aide that will be specifically instructing you, this is what's going to happen. We're going to open the door. We're going to go in. The President's going to do this and that. And you're going to shake his hand. You're going to sit over here you'll be prepared for meeting the president. Well, today we turn a corner in the book of Job, and Elihu comes to do this with Job. Elihu comes to prepare Job for what's coming next. Now, where are we at? Where have we, have we come to with Job? If you haven't been here with us, if you don't know the story of Job, God says about Job in the beginning three times that God was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. Great, great man of God, greatest man in all of the East with his possessions, his fame, his honor. And the devil, we read, went to God and challenged God and said, Job just does all of this because you bless him. Take away your hand of blessing and Job will curse you to his face. And for reasons we still don't understand, God said yes. God was in control. The devil doesn't do anything in my life that God couldn't stop, that God doesn't allow. And God allowed the devil to systematically remove all of Job's possessions, all ten of his children, and then his health. Yeah. So that we've found Job for these last uh, several chapters sitting on the dung heap outside town with boils from head to foot, swollen, darkened skin. 
And so we've listened as Job's three friends came with good intentions, but they've given a mixture of some good advice about God, but some very poor advice. They have assumed about Job all that they knew. This book, the story that it holds, happened three to 5,000 years before Christ. The story itself is at the very beginning, back in the very beginning in the patriarchal time. And all that they knew was that if you do bad, bad things happen. If you do good, good things happen. And so that's the framework from which his friends are working. And so they give some poor advice. They assume that since these bad things are happening to Job, then Job must have done wrong. Job never claims to be sinless, but he says, I've examined my life. I don't see where this is coming from. And so Job, we have seen, be very honest with God. He's complained. But he has allowed his, his, his crises, his trials, to draw him to God rather than send him away from God. So even in his complaint, he's complaining to God, and he's drawing very close to God. And so Elihu comes to prepare Job for what is coming. Now, up until now, we've had some questions about God. That age-old question, is God all-powerful? and yet uncaring? Is that why bad things happen to good people? Or is God caring, but the problem is He simply doesn't have the power to keep bad things from happening to us. And I hope if you've been with us, you've understood that the Scripture teaches us that neither of those scenarios is true, that God is all-powerful and He is all-loving. But as we sing about today, He's God, and I'm not. That's right. And that causes problems for me. That causes frustrations for me. It causes doubts and questions. But we must determine that those doubts and questions, those things that we don't understand yet, will always lead us to God, to cling to Him. And so Elihu is going to help us to make this transition. Elihu is different. Well, we're going to look at some highlights first in chapter 32, beginning in verse 1. Then these three men, Job's other friends, ceased answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes, at least by their estimation. Verse 2, but the anger of Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite of the family of Ram, burned. It burned against Job because he justified himself before God. The meaning there is Job has lifted himself up as an equal to God, at least in his eyes. Job has gotten close to that. And perhaps, as some have suggested, God has said, That's enough before Job crosses the line. Verse 3, his anger burned against the three friends because they had found no answer, and yet they had condemned Job. And so here are the friends. The friends are going to be condemned by God as well, but the friends are condemned here because it is true that they found nothing wrong in Job, and yet they assumed and therefore condemned him. Now, Elihu had waited to speak to Job because they were years older than he. And when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of the three men, his anger burned. So Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite, spoke out and said, I am young in years and you're old. Therefore, I was shy and afraid to tell you what I think. I thought age should speak and increased years should teach wisdom. But it is a spirit in man and the breath of the Almighty gives them understanding. The abundant in years may not be wise, nor may elders understand justice. So he reminds us that just because we're older doesn't mean that we're wise. Yes, the young should give deference and honor to the older, but it doesn't mean we're wise just because I've heard some really, really bad advice from older people, and certainly, obviously, from younger people as well. But it's not just being older that makes us wise. It's are we listening to God? Where are we getting our wisdom from? And if so, God will use us to be incredibly wise. We know how to not do life, and we've bumped into that wall. And so are we getting our wisdom from God to help others? So he says, listen to me, in verse 10, and I will tell you what I think. Behold, I waited for your words. I listened to your reasonings while you pondered what to say. I even paid close attention to you. Indeed, there was no one who refuted Job, not one of you who answered his words. And so we move on over to verse 19. And Elihu says, behold, my belly is like unvented wine. Like new wineskins, it is about to burst. Let me speak that I may get relief. Let me open my lips and answer. Let me now be partial to no one, nor flatter any man. 
For I do not know how to flatter, else my maker would soon take me away. Elihu says, I've been listening for all these days, and I'm about to explode. Great, Elihu, with what are you about to explode? Well, I'm glad you asked, because we go over into chapter 33, beginning in verse 8. Surely you have spoken in my hearing, and I've heard the sound of your words. And he's now talking to Job, quoting him, quote, I am pure without transgression. I am innocent, and there is no guilt in me. Behold, he, God, invents pretexts against me. He counts me as his enemy. He puts my feet in the stocks. He watches all my paths. And then Elihu says, Behold, let me tell you, you are not right in this, for God is greater than man. He rebukes Job for accusing God. And Job, we have seen, has, has gotten up to that dangerous point. Matthew McKellar says that our arms are too short, far too short, to box with God. And that's what Elihu is saying to Job. He says, hold on a second, you're crossing a line. And then we move over to verse 13, we pick back up. And then in this section, Elihu is going to tell us what God does, how God does speak, because the question that, that some have asked, is God there, and is He silent? And Elihu is going to uh, resoundingly say, He is there, and He is not silent. He might just not be saying what you want to hear and what I want to hear. So beginning in verse 13, why do you complain against Him, against God, that He does not give an account of all His doings? And McKellar has also gone on to say, God doesn't need an accountability partner. And that's what Elihu is saying here. What, you're, you're, you're questioning God because He's not giving account to you, Job? Indeed, God speaks once or twice, yet no one notices. In a dream, a vision of the night, when sound sleep falls on men while they slumber in their beds, then He opens the ears of men and seals their instruction that He may turn man aside from his conduct and keep man from pride. He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from passing over into Sheol. Man is also chastened with pain on his bed and with unceasing complaint in his bones, so that his life loathes bread and his soul his favorite food. His flesh wastes away from sight, and his bones which were not seen stick out. He's giving us a couple of different scenarios here in which God does speak. The first one, he says, is God speaks to sinful man to turn us back from our sinful ways. And he gives this example of on our beds, busy, 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 knowing that we're going away from God, knowing that our life is not pleasing to God, but we drown Him out with busyness, with noise, until nightfall comes, and we're laying on our bed, and God says, I've been waiting for you to slow down. And one of the most wonderful things God does, he says, is that he speaks truth to us who are far from him. <clears throat> One to the person who's never come to know Christ as Savior, God speaks his truth to you. And when I pray for the lost, I learned this from my wife, it's so, so true, that when we pray, we, well, the Scripture tells us, of course, that we pray God's will, we know he's answering, he's listening, he's acting. But I can pray with, with confidence for a lost friend, a lost neighbor, a lost loved one. God, would you speak truth to them, the truth of their need for you right now? Well, that's a prayer of God's will. Now, they don't have to obey, but wherever they're at right now, God, just flood their mind, flood their thoughts with truth about you and their need for salvation. God speaks to us. He spoke to me about my need for salvation. If you've come to know Christ, He spoke to you, and we're given a chance, a chance to turn to Him or a chance to reject Him. Mm -hmm. Some of you today, what you need to be confronted with by God's Word is that God is speaking to you, Amen. and you've been pushing Him away. Repentance is your friend. Repentance is your way out of the misery of the devil life that you're living. And you need today to say, God, I'm no longer going to push you away. I will repent, not just for a quick fix to get back on my path to sin, 
but to say, God, I'll do anything <laughs> to turn from the sin in my life. <laughs> I pray that God, in His gentle but sovereign, righteous ways, will confront us today. We're all sinners, but I'm talking about a lifestyle of sin. You know it. And you're really not doing what it takes to get out. God speaks. But he goes on here. He says, he also speaks in pain. And you say, in my pain, God is not speaking to me. And Elihu is saying, it may be that in your pain, that is how God is speaking to you. And again, he doesn't answer all the questions. But there are things we don't know that God may be doing in our pain. He may be keeping us from error. He may be keeping us from pride. He's certainly teaching us. I've learned much more about God in my pain than I have in the easy times. I don't like that. I'd rather read a book about someone else's pain. But I learn about God in pain. It humbles me. It gives me compassion for others. It puts a longing in my heart for the Lord, for His coming. I mean, we as Americans, we still sing songs about the Lord coming. And the hymnal is full of the songs of the Lord's return. But as Americans today, we really don't long for it like we should. And there's no better way to long for it than pain and suffering. We pick back up here in verse 22. Then his soul draws near to the pit and his life to those who bring death. Psalm 103, which I love, talks about this pit. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord and forget none of his benefits who pardons all my iniquities. Because that's the, the biggest thing we need. I mean, I'd love to have perfect health. I'd love to have things not go wrong. But the biggest problem we have is our sin. And Jesus Christ. died on the cross for your sin. And he wants to pay that price. He did pay it. He wants you to receive it today. So he pardons all my iniquities. That's enough. But he also redeems my life from the pit, he says. Amen. Amen. He redeems my life from the pit. He heals all my diseases, either here on this earth or in eternity with God in heaven. And then in verse 23, and again, remember that Job, as some have said, is a rough draft for the gospel. I mean, here we are, three to 5,000 years before the coming of Christ. And we see so many foreshadows, so many allusions to one who must exist. There has to be a mediator, he says in verse 23. If there's an angel as a mediator for him, one out of a thousand, one unique to remind a man what is right for him, there is a mediator, and he's Christ Jesus, the angel of the Lord, not just an angel, but the angel of the Lord. You must come to know him as your Savior today. He says, then let him be gracious to him and say, deliver him from going down to the pit, I found a ransom, and we know the ransom is in Jesus. Let his flesh be fresher than in youth. Let him return to the days of his youthful vigor. Then one will pray to God, and then he will accept him, that, that he may see his face with joy, and he may restore his righteousness to man. And he will sing to men and say, this, this restored one who God spoke to him, he turned back to God, then he will sing, and his testimony will say in verse 27, I've sinned and perverted what is right. And it is not proper for me. But he has redeemed my soul from going to the pit, and my life shall see the light. Is that your story today? And if you say, I didn't need it, I'm not a sinner. Oh, brother, oh, sister, your biggest sin is pride and lying to God. You need it. But is that your testimony? I was headed my own way, but I met the Redeemer who paid the ransom. Amen. I sinned. But he's turned me back, not to be sinless until I enter heaven's gate, but to walk with the one who has ransomed me as he daily, little by little, causes me to be more like him. Well, over in chapter 34, we must progress. Verse 5 and following. For Job has said, and now here Elihu again is rebuking Job for what he has said. Job has said, I am righteous, but God has taken away my right. Should I lie concerning my right? My wound is incurable, though I am w without transgression. And then Elihu mocks him. What man is like Job, who drinks up derision like water, who goes in company with the workers of iniquity and walks with the wicked man? For he, Job, has said, it profits a man nothing when he's pleased with God. And he's quoting Job from earlier. Job had said, he'd questioned out loud, does, does it do any good 
to, to follow God, to obey God and please Him? In verse 10, he goes on, Therefore listen to me, you men of understanding, quote, unquote, you three men. Far be it from God to do wickedness and from the Almighty to do wrong. For he pays a man according to his work and makes him find it according to his way. Surely God will not act wickedly, and the Almighty will not pervert justice. Again, he's reminding us of these truths that we must establish in our heart. I don't understand it all, God, but I will declare with my mouth, I will believe with my heart that you will not do injustice. That's right. You will not do wrong. And he asked a great question in verse 13. Who gave God authority over the earth? And who has laid on him the whole world? And the answer, of course, is no one. He created the world. That's why he is in absolute control over it. And how silly it would be to think that the world happened and that God discovered it and is now over it. Well, how nice is this? Someone's created the world. I think I'll rule it. No, he created it. He spoke it into existence. That's why he's over it. You create something, it's yours. Who laid it on him? No one. In verse 14 and 15, he asked this question. If he should determine to do so, if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together, That's and right. man would return to dust. God created the world. He holds it together. Over in Colossians 1, we read about Jesus that he still holds all things together. He holds the molecules in your body together. He holds the molecules in the pew that you're sitting on together. He holds all things. In him all was created for him and through him, and in him all things hold together. And Eli who says, if God just took himself out for a second, we'd all perish. Everything constantly dependent on God. And then we question him. I question him. Honesty is good. But keep your perspective. Over in verse 21. For his eyes are upon the ways of a man. He sees all his steps. Isn't this what we teach our children? We do right, not just when people are watching. Even if mom and dad aren't there, God is there. It's the same for us grown-ups. There's no darkness or deep shadow where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. For he does not need to consider a man further that he should go before God in judgment. He breaks in pieces mighty men without inquiry, and he sets others in their place. God knows everything in my life. He knows every thought. He knows every word. He knows every action. Young people, children, when your parents aren't there, God's there. And God has an amazing way of letting your parents know. How does that happen? I don't know. It happened to me as a child. Now it happens to me as a parent. But God is being kind, loving, because the worst thing that could happen is for us to live in sin and it be unexposed. That's right. God exposes it for our good because He loves us. And again, there's some today in a room this size. You're hiding it. You're living a double life. And I'm just telling you, it's God's mercy and love that He's exposing it again today because He wants you to have life and life abundantly. And you're living in misery. And all you have to do is repent. It won't be easy. It'll be the hardest thing you've ever done. But on the other side of it, it'll be the greatest experience you've ever had in your life. Oh, God hears. Oh, and the psalmist tells us over and over, God hears the cry of the heart who has faith in God. None of us are perfect. None of us ever turn perfectly from our ways. But the heart that says, God, I do believe you're God. I want to turn from my ways. God hears that cry. In verse 14, how much less when you say you do not behold him the case, your case, is before him, and you must wait for him. He says, Job, don't think God lost your case. Don't think that you've gotten bumped from the docket. God knows your case. And I'm sorry to say to you, Job, he's not working on your timetable. Amen. And I'm sorry to say to Ronnie Cooksey that God doesn't work on my timetable. He says, you must wait. Verse 15, and now because he is not visited in his anger, nor has he acknowledged transgression well, so Job opens his mouth emptily. He multiplies words without knowledge. Wow. And I'm afraid that's, that's me too many times. I trust him, but sometimes I trust him to act at the pace that I want him to act. And sometimes there's just no answer except wait. And just going again to God, God, I come again today. 
I believe you have the power that you could speak the word and I'd be healed of this. But again today, I submit to you and say that though you slay me, I will trust you and praise you, as Job said. Even if this situation, this health, this discouragement, this persecution, even if it doesn't change, I will praise you today. I'll complain all day long, but I'll do so in faith, knowing that you could change it. But I want to say that I want you to get glory one way or the other in my life. That's not easy. It takes going to God over and over and over. And then in verse, chapter 36, verses 17 through 21, and here he warns Job again. He says, Job, you were full of judgment on the wicked. Judgment and justice take hold of you. Beware that wrath does not entice you to scoffing, and do not let the greatness of the ransom turn you aside. Will your riches keep you from distress or all the forces of your strength? Do not long for the night when people vanish in their place. Be careful. Do not turn to evil, for you have preferred this to affliction. So Job understandably in his pain he's looking around and saying God that one over there is a lot worse than me why am I suffering like this God that man over there spits in your face why am I suffering like this he says Job your focus is not in the right place your focus is judging others instead of your focus on God and how easy is that for me how easy is that for you to do and then he warns him he said Job you were talking some foolish talk you were saying I wish that the lights could turn off I wish that I could cease to exist. I wish I could be in the time of darkness. He says, no, no, Job, you're not God. Don't wish for that. And he warns Job, and he warns me, and he warns you. Well, our last chapter here, Job 37, and in verses 5 and 6, God thunders with his voice wondrously, doing great things which we cannot comprehend. For to the snow, he says, fall on the earth. And to the downpour and the rain, he says, be strong. And just again, a reminder that Eli, who says to Job and says to me, God does so much more than you could ever imagine. If, if, if we pictured what God is actually doing right now, Amen. it'd knock us off our feet. And he says, you just don't know. Remind yourself. This is why I love the Old Testament. I love the New Testament. But I love the Old Testament because it's the same God. That's right. It's the same God that, that Abraham prayed to, that Isaac prayed to, that Job prayed to, that King David prayed to. That's the God I prayed to this morning. And, and we learn so much about God in the Old Testament. Don't ever give up your Old Testament. Now, Elihu's not claiming, as the three men did, that Job's problems were a result of his sin, but he is saying, Job, be careful. Remember. And then down to verse 13. This is, he says, what God's doing, whether for correction or for his world, or for loving kindness, he causes it to happen. God has purposes. We don't know what they are, but he's acting in these ways. Listen to this, O Job. Stand and consider the wonders of God. Do you know how God establishes them and makes the lightning of his cloud to shine? Again, just one small example. So many in the book of Job. He says all these things, and God's going to give us a litany, and we will look at those next week of the things that he wants to know if Job could replicate and duplicate that God does. That's what parents do, right? Don't we do things that our children think are stupid and harmful and mean and rotten? And we're doing them out of loving kindness, and sometimes we can't explain. There are times that I, I, I can't. I, I mean, I try. It's, it's important as parents. If you can, tell your children why. But sometimes you can't. Amen. Sometimes I just have to, I just, I'm sorry. I just have a responsibility as your father. And I don't know how to explain it to you right now. And he says, that's what's God. Sometimes God, just it's not what, for us to know. But then the last two verses, verses 23 and 24. The Almighty, we can't find him. And he, and he means we can't find him in that we could just put him in a box and comprehend him. And aren't you glad you can't explain God fully? Wouldn't that be a, a, a lousy Christian experience if we could just explain God quickly? Amen. We'd be more powerful than God. We can't find him. We can't put him in a box. My God doesn't exist in our little boxes. He's exalted in power. And he will not do violence to justice and abundant righteousness. Therefore, men fear him. He does not regard any who consider themselves 
wise of heart. He pays attention to the one who sees themselves as helpless and in need of God. Is that where you're at today? Some of you today, again, you need to repent. It may be privately here at the altar. It may be where you're at, maybe with someone else in this room. But God's speaking to you. Oh, oh, he's not silent. It's just that we don't like what he's saying. I'm telling you, repentance is your friend. Proverbs tells us, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. and The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. God is at work. I was reading yesterday in my quiet time in Isaiah 40, so similar to what Elihu is saying here. Why do you say, O Jacob, and why do you assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? Isn't that what we're saying so many times? God, you, you miss me. And the justice due me escapes the notice of my God. How could God not see that I don't deserve this? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary. And to those who lack might, he increases power. Though youth grow weary and tired, and though young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord, those who wait for the Lord, it doesn't mean just sitting around doing nothing. It means a a lot of things. We're talking about this in devotions. I said to the kids, what does that mean to wait for the Lord? He had some great answers. It means to keep doing the last thing you said to do. It means to keep seeking him. It means sitting daily at his feet in his word and in prayer, waiting. God, I don't understand. I don't have the answers. But I have determined that you will be my source. Those who wait will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. And they will walk and not be weary. He is at work. His timetable is very different than mine. He is speaking. Either about our sin or even speaking through, by the means of our pain. We don't know why. Wait. He's working according to his might and his wisdom. Pray to him cry to him, build faith in him, surrender over and over and over to his will. That's what Jesus did. The man in Jesus didn't like what he knew was about to happen, but he knew God had a purpose, and it must happen, and so he surrendered to the Father. One has said, when I'm so busy justifying myself to God, that's when I can't hear him, because I'm doing the talking. There's an old, old hymn that, that, uh, that I love, and I just, some of you know it, you're welcome to sing along, but I just sing the first verse. There is never a day so dreary, there is never a night so long, but the soul that is trusting Jesus will somewhere find a song. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus, in the heart he implanteth a song, a song of deliverance, of courage and strength. In the heart he implanteth a song. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are speaking, even when I don't seem to hear you. And Father, I pray for the the crowd that's gathered here today that you would speak and that we would hear. And what you're saying is so different for each one of us. Lord, there are those who today need to surrender by repenting and saying, God, I am finally willing to do whatever it takes. I'll confess it to whoever it takes, to whomever it takes to shine the light on it, to make it stop and to call sin, sin and to quit listening to the devil saying it's not hurting anyone. There are some today, Lord, in deep pain. And I don't have the simple answer for them, but I pray today that you would just remind them of these truths, that you are working, you are speaking, and you are pleased if they're clinging to you. And I just, I think about the, the folks in this room, and I'm, I, I see people in this room, Lord, I know you're working. I know that you're getting glory through the way that they're responding. 
You're using them as a witness in ways that you have decided you couldn't use them. Otherwise, give them grace, patience, strength to wait on you, to trust in you today. And God, there are ways that you've spoken that have nothing to do with what I've said, but you've spoken. Help us today to respond to you. Some to come to Christ for the first time to say, that's the God that I want to know through the cross of Jesus who loved me so. Some need to come today and say, I want to go public and follow believer's baptism. Help them to step out and boldly say, I want to go public in my walk with Christ. Some need to make this their church home for this time in their life. Give them the boldness, the wisdom to say, yes, I'm no longer going to just kind of be here. I'm going to say, I'm in until God leads me elsewhere. And in a multitude of ways you've spoken, help us respond today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.